I'll be reading 2 Timothy 1, 8 through 14. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord of, or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God, who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted to us in Christ for all eternity but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel for which I was appointed as a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher. For this reason I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed, for I know who I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to protect that which I have entrusted to him entrusted to him until that day. Hold on to the example of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Protect through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure of that which has been entrusted to you. Good morning once again. We um, have been studying this year, for the benefit of those of you, you visiting with us, we've been studying this year the subject of the Holy Spirit, uh, being led by the Spirit. Over the last several years, we've kind of adopted a theme to guide our Sunday morning lessons each year. A couple of years ago, we studied the kingdom. Uh, last year, we spent our Sunday mornings discussing love, and this year, we're um, using as our theme vor verse Romans 8 verse 1 that talks about being led by the Spirit. And, and so we've been kind of preaching our way through uh, um, a series, uh, series after series, sort of mini series after mini series of, uh, of lessons on the Spirit. We've looked at, at a lot of different uh, aspects of the Spirit, some of them, um, some of them familiar and comfortable, others of them uh, that stretch our understanding a little bit, that stretch our knowledge for sure, of, of who the Spirit is and what the Spirit is for uh, and what the Spirit does for us. And um, this one this morning kind of falls into that later category, I think, of, of being one that is, um, has stretched my, uh, my view a little bit of what it is that we're trying to accomplish this year and, and uh, I think is, is going to lead us in some interesting directions as we move forward from this time, uh, from this lesson. So... Uh, I always like to start with just kind of a short recap or, or putting us into, um, into the context of what we've been talking about here lately, and, and recently we started looking at the idea of following the Spirit based on the idea that if we're, we're being led by the Spirit, the Spirit is a leader, then we need to be followers, and, and so what does it mean to follow the Spirit? And so we, we looked a couple of weeks ago at Romans 14, verse 7, uh, that talks about... Um, the, the fruit of the Spirit, or not the fruit of the Spirit, that's a whole different series that's coming up later. Uh, but um, the, the Spirit is, life in the Spirit is peace, righteousness, peace, and joy. I can't spit it out. There we go. Uh, righteousness, peace, and joy is where the Spirit is leading. And if we find ourselves going in a direction that is not leading us towards righteousness, peace, and joy, then we're not following the Spirit because the Spirit does not lead us anywhere other than into righteousness and into peace and into joy. And so it doesn't mean we don't go through things in this life, but as the Spirit leads us through those things that we deal with in this world or in this life, He is always leading us to righteousness, peace, and joy. And so um, then within that context of, of the Spirit leading us uh, within the realm of peace, uh, last week we looked at the, uh, the idea of conscience and how our conscience relates to the Spirit. And, and that was kind of unexpected territory for us to get into as I had been thinking about earlier in the year what direction we would go as we study the Spirit. I had not anticipated a lesson on conscience until it sort of just started coming up uh, in some of, the, some of the reading that I was doing. And so um, that was probably the first lesson on conscience. As, and as we move forward through the year, I think We'll probably come back and revisit that subject at a later date uh, as we learn more about the Spirit. 
Um, and then today is kind of another lesson that went a different direction than I was expecting it to go, um, which um, led to the, the title changing and, and the, um, the points that I was kind of laying out uh, as to how this lesson would develop. Um, if, if you had looked at it early last week, it doesn't look anything like it looks now. Um, and that's because, uh, because of some things that we'll talk about as we make our way through the lesson this morning. But, um, but it all fits into that kind of that category of following the Spirit, following where the Spirit leads us, uh, with the understanding that the Spirit has a final destination in mind, and that final destination always involves righteousness, peace, and joy. And so uh, as we kind of reflect on this morning's Scripture reading from First Timothy, or Second Timothy rather, Second <clears throat> um, Timothy chapter one. The first thing that I w- just want to do is is find the spirit in the obvious place. I mean, if you if you followed along with that reading, or if I just laid this passage out in front of you and 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 asked you to to you know what do you think what do you think we're going to talk about this morning? Um, for me, and and from the time that I chose this passage and began working on it, the the thing that drew my attention was treasure. And maybe that tells you something about me. I don't know. But um, verse 14 is, is where my attention is drawn when I just read this passage uh, and, and, and kind of take it at its face value. Where he says, guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. And, and I don't know about you, but treasure, treasure draws our attention. Think of... Think of like the movies that you've seen, Indiana Jones and the Temple of, of Doom or Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade or whatever, any of those Indiana Jones movies. And there's always a scene in that movie where he walks into the treasure room, right? And, and there's the thing that he's been searching. And, and it's a big cinematic moment where they pan across that treasure and it's sparkly and it's shiny and, it's, and, it, and it entices us to, to step toward it uh, and, and to grab hold of it. And you can think of that about any of those big cinematic movies, Pirates of the, uh, of the Caribbean or, or any bank robber movie where they bust into the vault and they open the vault and there's all the money, right? There it is, the treasure that they've been seeking. And so it's this concept of treasure that just draws us toward it. And, and I think that's okay because even Jesus uses treasure, right? He talks about treasure. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 21 do not store up for yourself treasures on earth. Don't get blinded by the glitz and the glamour and the, the things of this life that present themselves as treasure, but really in the end are no treasure at all. Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also." God has instilled within us a desire to seek treasure. Now, we have to make sure that we're seeking the right treasure, that we're seeking the correct treasure, because there is a treasure that will one day rot away, that will one day be worth nothing. But there is a treasure that we can seek that will last through eternity. And that is the treasure that God wants us to seek. And so there is a treasure involved in following the Spirit. The Spirit is leading us toward treasure. And if we get blinded and, and distracted by the treasure that this world offers, then we lose focus and lose sight of the treasure that the Spirit is leading us toward. And I think we see an example of, of that in Luke chapter 18, where Jesus spoke to, we commonly call him the rich young ruler. And in this story, the, the rich young man asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus went through some of the commands, you know, don't steal, don't commit adultery, don't, don't murder. And he said, oh, well, I, I haven't done any of those things. And Jesus said to him in verse 22, one thing you still lack, sell all that you possess and distribute it to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven and come follow me. See, this rich young man had lots of treasure. He had lots of stuff. He had, had a, a storage shed out back of just all the neat things that he had accumulated. He had a big fat bank account. And he thought he had treasure. And Jesus said, get rid of all of that. Throw it all out. Be done with it. Because there is a treasure that is important. And put that treasure aside and store it up in heaven and come follow me. 
Jesus uses the idea of treasure to draw us into relationship with him, to draw us into communion with him, because he knows that we have a desire to seek treasure. The Apostle Paul writes about treasure in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He talks, if you, if you back up and read beginning in verse 1 of that chapter, he lists just a lot of things, and they're all the same thing. He talks about the gospel. He talks about our ministry. He talks about the knowledge of the glory of God. He says, uh, he talks about the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. He says the word of God, the manifestation of truth, Christ Jesus is Lord. All of these are the same thing. And in verse 7 he says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. All of these things that God supplies for us, our gospel, our ministry, our knowledge, our our relationship with Christ, all of those are a treasure that he has given us, that he has placed within us, within our earthen bodies. God has put his treasure inside of us. And treasure, in the context of following the Spirit in the direction of righteousness, peace, and joy, that's the lesson I thought I was going to teach today. That's what I thought we were going to discuss. Because it's important. There's there's no way to to lay that discussion aside and say, well, there's, that we shouldn't talk about it. But then I began digging a little deeper, and another word all of a sudden caught my attention. I took my eyes off the treasure, and I saw something else. I saw the word guard, because I really wanted to relate this to the Holy Spirit, and I didn't want to relate it to treasure, even though I think the two are related and, and I could make that connection. But I really want this lesson to be about the Holy Spirit. And, and so I, I went back and I looked at verse 14 again, and it says, guard through the Holy Spirit. See, the, the Spirit is doing something specific in relation to our treasure, right? The treasure is there. It has been provided by God. It has been secured by Him. It has been meted out by Him. But the Holy Spirit's relationship to that treasure is the Holy Spirit is the guard of that treasure. He is the one who secures it. He is the one who maintains its safety. Guard it from those who would steal that treasure. Guard it from those who would corrupt it, who would defile it in some way. Guard it from those who would change it into something that is no treasure at all. The Holy Spirit has a job within relation uh, a job in relation to the treasure. And if you back up a few verses in 2 Timothy chapter 1 Paul says in verse 12 I know whom I have believed and I am convinced that he is able to guard that which I have entrusted to him until that day and see there's a relationship between those two words we have on the one hand God who is guarding something that I have given him well what can I possibly give God and what could I possibly give God that is important enough that he places a guard over it we have given him ourselves our souls we have given him our trust our faith And God takes that which we have given him and he sees it as so precious, so valuable that he guards it and he's not going to let anything happen to it. Turn with me to John chapter 10. John chapter 10, Jesus talks within the context of, of declaring himself to be the good shepherd Jesus reveals this to us. He says in verse 27 through 30, he says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they shall never perish, and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. And my Father, has, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. See, God guards what we have given him, the faith the trust, the hope that we place in God, he protects it. And then Paul turns right around in 2 Timothy chapter 1, and he tells us to guard what God has entrusted to us, the treasure that God has given us. But here's the thing, that is so precious, and it is so important that we guard it, 
that God doesn't say guard it on your own. Guard it through your own power, through your own strength, through your own wisdom. He says guard it with my power. Guard it with my spirit. Guard it with the same power with which I am guarding the things that you have given me. And so the same strength, the same power that God uses to guard what we give Him is the power that we use to guard what He has given us. And after kind of thinking through that a little bit, I, I realized that I had focused on the treasure, which is good. It's good treasure because God's given it to us, and I don't want to discount that. But by focusing on the treasure, I'd almost missed the connection to the Holy Spirit. I'd almost missed really the the thing that paul was trying to say about what the spirit does for us and so that begged the question what else had i missed what else in this passage as i was focusing on what i thought i needed to preach on was i missing so i went back and i looked and i started looking for what i had missed and then i started finding the spirit all over the place Let's look back at verses 3 through 8 of 2 Timothy chapter 1. I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience the way my forefathers did as I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day, longing to see you even as I recall your tears so that I may be filled with joy. For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I'm sure that it is in you as well. And for this reason, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. And I started reading that part as an introduction to what I had been focusing on earlier, and I and I read it, and I reread it, and I reread it, and I kept looking for the Spirit. And you know what? Oh, He's in there. He's in there all along the way. You want to see where I found Him? Well, look at verse 3. Paul says in verse 3, I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience. That one kind of was obvious because we just, we just learned about that last week. I mean, I don't know if you can remember last Sunday's sermon, but I usually remember them at least for a week or so uh, after I preach them. But just last Sunday, we talked about conscience. And so that one stepped out and, and it kind of realized, well, there's a connection to the Spirit there because the Spirit and our conscience are not the same thing as we talked about last week, but they are connected. And so then I, I said, well, is, is there anything else there that is related to the Spirit? And I remembered sometime back when we were looking at Romans chapter 8 and all of the things that are said about the Spirit in Romans chapter 8 and how we learned that the Spirit is an intercessor for us and the Spirit interacts with us in our prayers that he is there he is present when we pray and so paul mentions prayers in this verse that that he is praying and and night and day for them and that sounds to me like something that the spirit would be involved in as paul is ministering to these people to timothy and to the congregations that timothy is working with and so then moving on to verse four paul says that uh, even as I recall your tears, so I may be filled with joy. Well, where is it that the Spirit leads us? The Spirit is leading us to joy. The Spirit, remember, leads us to righteousness, to peace, to joy, to those three things. And, and so if Paul is, is recalling his relationship with other Christians and it brings him joy, then the Spirit is involved in that. The Spirit is calling to mind his remembrance of those things and his fueling that joy that he feel, feels as he recalls that relationship In verse five this is this is one that that we're going to have to develop a little bit because paul mentions here for i am mindful of the sincere faith within you which first dwelt in your grandmother lois well what is it that we've been talking about all year long that dwells in us it's the spirit the Spirit dwells in us, and so, so think with me about the fact that the Spirit dwells in us, but Paul says faith dwells in us as well. 
Well, if, if those two things are residing within us, then are they not related to one another in some way? Is there not a connection between our faith and the Spirit? And that got me thinking about all of the things that the New Testament says resides in us. We, we have other things that are in us because of our relationship with Christ. And if the Spirit is in us and these other things that are spiritual blessings are also in us, then the Spirit must be related to all of those things. I feel a new series coming on. Things that reside in us along with the Holy Spirit. I think that one will be entitled Living with the Spirit. And I think it, it will be a, a series of things that we look at about how when I strengthen my faith, how does that strengthen the presence of the Spirit in my life? And when I strengthen the presence of the Spirit in my life, how does that strengthen my faith? There's got to be a relationship there, and I'm not sure it's one that I ever fully considered before. We also could look at verse 6, and verse 6 is one that... Um, the gift of God, and he's speaking specifically there about uh, kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying out of my hands, which is in, in apostolic language is, is talking about the gift that uh, Paul has bestowed to Timothy through the laying out of his hands as, as an apostle. And so there is a, a miraculous manifestation of the Holy Spirit that Timothy is able uh, to do things because of his relationship with the Holy Spirit. And we haven't even preached any lessons on that yet. We haven't even studied that. And, I, and I've avoided that intentionally, not for the reasons you might think. But, but we'll get there. We're going to get to those lessons. And then the same with verses 7 and 8. Uh, first of all, we'll talk about uh, the things mentioned uh, up on the board, verse 7 and 8, for God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but a power and love and discipline. And I set those two aside because those two, love for sure appears on the list of the fruit of the spirit, if you remember the song we sang just a little bit ago, and discipline, well that's really similar to self-control and that's in the song, and so when you think about the gifts of the spirit or the fruit of the spirit that we have, uh, I haven't preached anything on those yet, but we're headed there. We're going to get to those. And so there's things that are related to the Spirit, some of which we've studied, some of which we have not even, uh, not even delved into yet that I had completely missed when I read through this passage until I started looking for the Spirit and the connection to the Spirit as I read through uh, at, at a second glance. And then... This one, finally, verses 7 and 8, we have the word power mentioned twice. In verse 7, we have not a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me as prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. And Paul writing in Ephesians 3.16 says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. Then uh, skipping down to Ephesians 3.20, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that is at work within us. That power that we have to do things that we think we can't do, that frankly we don't have the ability to do, but God grants us the ability. He empowers us to do things that are beyond our own ability. That is the Holy Spirit. And so we, here we have a, a series of things that if you look, you can find the Spirit. But if you're not looking for the Spirit, you can read that entire passage and never see a connection to Him. Now let me ask, if, if we read it and don't see those connections, is that connection still there, or is it just gone? Well, that connection exists, even if we don't see it. But what doors and, and what possible things are made available to us when we do see those connections? When we see them in places we've never seen them before, when we realize that God is working in ways that we've never realized it before, when God is present in ways that we have never noticed his presence before, what doors are open to us? We need to realize that God is everywhere. The Spirit is is everywhere i love psalm 139 it's a, a beautiful one it um several songs have come out of this psalm it's a 
just a, a beautiful work of Scripture. The first 12 verses especially fit with what we're talking about today, that, that God is everywhere. O Lord, Thou hast searched me and known me. Thou dost know when I sit down and when I rise up. Thou dost understand my thought from afar. Thou dost scrutinize my path and my lying down and art intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, thou dost know it all. Thou hast enclosed me behind and before and laid thy hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain to it. Where can I go from thy spirit? Or where can I flee from thy presence? If I ascend to heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there thy hand will lead me, and thy right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me, and the light around me will be night, even the darkness is not dark to thee, and the night is as bright as the day, darkness and light are alike to thee. And then the conclusion of that psalm, verses 23 and 24, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts, and see if there be any hurtful way in me, and lead me in the everlasting way. God is there in the obscure places, in the places we, we find ourselves when we don't think God can possibly be there. He is. He's there waiting for us to find him. We need, as Paul, uh, or we need to remember this. We kind of prefaced this entire year's study, study on the Holy Spirit by acknowledging at the beginning that we've sort of been willfully ignorant of this subject. We haven't taught on it as much as we should have. I haven't preached on it as much as I should have. We haven't done the Bible classes on it like we should have. We, we've kind of avoided the topic because sometimes it's hard. Because sometimes it's difficult to understand. And because, frankly, sometimes it makes us uncomfortable. It puts us into situations where we might have to disagree with somebody that we love or somebody that, somebody that we're sitting next to. Or somebody that we work with or something that somebody else does in their worship service and because of those uncomfortable scenarios we have avoided looking for the spirit shame on us we should do better paul told timothy in the passage that we've read this morning we need to kindle afresh the gift that is in us a few moments ago, I asked the question, is, is the Spirit in that passage even when we don't see Him there? Sure. He was there all along. I had just missed it because I was focused on other things. Is the Spirit in our lives even when we don't notice Him? I think so. Think of it this way. Have you ever been introduced to someone new, like... You just meet somebody for the first time, and you learn their name, and you learn a little bit about them, and then later that week, you run into them at Walmart, and you see them at the gas station, and you see them at Dillon's, and you run into them in the park, and all of a sudden, this person that you just met seems to be everywhere. What are the chances that that person was in all those places already? You just never noticed them because you had never been introduced before. That's probably the more likely scenario. And so as we think about our relationship to the Spirit, think of it as this year we're sort of being introduced to the Spirit. And I wonder how many things the Spirit has been touching in our lives before this series of lessons came along, and we just never noticed His presence. But I wonder if, after we study the Spirit for a year, we'll start finding Him in places that we never thought He was before. It's not because He wasn't there. It's because we just never noticed Him. We didn't recognize Him 
for what he is. I, a couple of the things that I mentioned, in fact, some of the, the, you know, the fruit of the Spirit. How can you be five months into the, into the year talking about the Spirit and not have preached on the fruit of the Spirit yet? Well, it's because I wanted to get to know the Spirit first. Before we start talking about some of those things that seem like the more obvious directions that we should go, I want us to understand who it is that we're talking about. And so there are things coming that uh, in the future that I hope will be more impactful because we have taken this time through the early part of the year to really get to know the Spirit. Our call to action this morning is simply this. When the Spirit seems hard to find, adjust your focus. The Spirit was there. 2 Timothy chapter 1, the Spirit was there in every one of those verses. But I was so focused on the treasure at the end that I miss seeing the Spirit along the way on the journey. And I definitely want us to stay focused on that treasure at the end. The treasure is important. Jesus told us to store up the treasure. But let's not get so focused on the treasure at the end that we miss seeing the Spirit's involvement along the way. If you have any need to bring before the congregation this morning, if there's anything that you can, we can help you with or pray for you in any way, would you please come while we stand and sing?